I am so happy to be here. Um, I'm sitting with Dr. Kelly Brogan, who is a holistic psychiatrist, formerly of New York, now in Miami, Florida. And it is just such an honor. Since I started Wellbe and well before that, I was interested in the idea of holistic and integrative psychiatry and the idea of treating mental illness without psychiatric drugs, which is, you know, very, um, which is not really done these days, um, certainly in the US. And so Kelly is just a pioneer in that. And she is one of the few known psychiatrists that, you know, takes a non-pharmaceutical approach to treating mental illness. And so she is a hero of mine and it's a real, real honor to be here with her today. So I have so many questions. Um, as anybody that knows me and has been following Welby knows, a lot of my inspiration for doing this was based on losing my mom and my mom's battle through the mental health care system. And something, you know, as her caretaker, seeing how that all went down was um, very eye-opening and disturbing as to a lot of the problems with the system today. And Kelly's book, which I've uh, read most of, um, talks a lot about the problems with the system today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my mom's case with her and you know how she may approaches some of these more serious mental illnesses, but also ask her a lot about anxiety and depression and these things that she sees you know all the time. So first thing I have to say is I know that you have an amazing story of health recovery um, through an experience that you had after you gave birth to your first daughter, I believe. Um, and before that was, you know, a totally conventional pill prescribing um, MD. And so I'd love if you'd share that with us. I feel like that, you know, gives a lot of explanation to why you're doing what you're doing today. Absolutely. So it's an important part of the context for what we'll speak about, you know, is that I was an entirely conventional um, physician before, you know, I had my own experience bumping up against the glass ceiling of what conventional medicine has to offer. And, and you'll find most renegade doctors have sort of jumped the fence because of our own personal health experiences. You, you, you live what your patients are going through as they, you know, are just in the realm of managing symptoms and, you know, indentured servants of this system that they never feel they can get out of. And until you experience that yourself, you don't really have the motivation to question anything that you've learned. Also because of the blood, sweat and tears that you invest in a medical education and, and training. So it, it wasn't until uh, as someone specialized, believe it or not, in prescribing to pregnant and breastfeeding women. That's how much I believed in the pharmaceutical model that I was one of the first 300 so-called reproductive psychiatrists who specialized in, you know, helping to manage the one in four women of reproductive age who found themselves either pregnant or looking to conceive. Uh, and it was in that context that I, um, after my own, you know, childbirth experience and postpartum window, uh, you know, prescribing every day to women just like me, I began to sort of have this funny feeling that I don't think I would want to take an antidepressant as a pregnant woman. Oh, that's an inconvenient feeling, you know, let's tuck that under the rug. And it wasn't until I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is um, an exceedingly common, especially in women, autoimmune condition um, that is particularly prevalent theoretically around 10% of postpartum women, I think it's probably far higher than is statistically documented. I was diagnosed with that about nine months postpartum on a routine physical. And of course, chalked all the symptoms that I was having of brain fog and memory issues, flat mood, a feeling of overwhelm, you know, hair and skin stuff. Uh, I chalked it up to new motherhood. You know, we love to make excuses so we don't have to actually address what our body is trying to tell us. And uh, I, that same sort of feeling cropped up where I said, I don't want to take a prescription for the rest of my life. You know, it's fine for my patients, apparently, but it's, I don't want to do that. And so I went to a naturopath in New York and it was with her help, um, Nicole Egenberger, that I, you know, changed my diet. I started some supplements and I watched because I was, you know, I'm still a very numbers, science oriented kind of a, you know, left brain kind of gal. And I watched my antibodies go from the high 2000s and a TSH of 20. I watched on paper that resolution, you know, in the space of a year. I said, well, wow, <laughs> I never learned that diet matters. 
in my, you know, Ivy League education. Um, you know, the average medical student doesn't have more than one hour of nutrition education. And it's really like a window dressing. It's like, by the way, if your patient's drinking like a 32 ounce Pepsi every day, probably just tell them maybe they shouldn't do that. That's literally the extent of it. Uh, and I also didn't learn that autoimmune conditions, chronic conditions could be put into remission through lifestyle change. And so that just because of my personality, my Irish Italian roots, I, you know, I had like a temper tantrum and I was like, what? <laughs> There's so much rage, you know, about how much I'd invested and sacrificed, you know, to, to learn only part of the story. And so I went back to the books. I'm very comfortable on PubMed.gov and reading primary papers and knowing how to interpret them. And, and that's what I did near obsessively for the ensuing years that I unpacked everything I assumed to be true. You know, birth control is every woman's, you know, right. Statins should be in the water. You know, antidepressants are, you know, the kindest thing we can do for pa patients and on and on and on. Antibiotics and acid blockers and everything that I just sort of assumed didn't have a dark side. I went and, and investigated it. And what I found was, you know, really shocking um, at worst and interesting at best and really became the foundation for a very new way of of practicing medicine. Wow. Well, I think all of us tend to be doing things like this if we have something that really helps us get Motivator, there. And yeah. it's yeah, it's like, you know, you wish it hadn't happened to you. Obviously nobody wishes you had gotten Hashimoto's, but once it's once you see what came of it, you're sort of like, no oh. regrets. I wouldn't change anything. Absolutely. And and that's what now I think is part of the mindset that um, really predicates any work I do with patients is until you understand that the body doesn't make mistakes, it's not here to bother you, right? And break down on you. And, and, and that these health crises, whether we identify them as hormonal or, or mental, emotional or gastrointestinal or, you know, oncological, whatever it is, are, are your, it's your life invitation to wake up, you know, and, and to begin to really align with who you are, how to take care of yourself, what you're here to do, and anyone who's, who's recovered or put, you know, a condition into remission or beat the odds, so to speak, will tell you the same thing. They wouldn't trade it for the world. And it was the, the moment of choice, you know, to say yes to it and walk towards it, walk through it, um, rather than just try to continue with business as usual, papering over your symptoms in an endless hamster wheel of trying to stay ahead of them. I want to ask you about treating these more serious things when it goes from, you know, trying to stay ahead of symptoms to full breakdown, because um, I think there's starting to be more, a little bit more, or at least because I focus on this, it seems that way, the, you know, a little echo chamber of uh, people talking about foods for depression and that there are things that you can do related to anxiety and depression, you know, that aren't so out to lunch. But then there's this wall up when it comes to any kind of a manic Yes, severe. Severe, and it's just like Don't nothing that you could do in your own life could ever have any effect on something like that happening, nor could you do something afterward to heal the brain. It's besides just, you know, pump full of drugs. And so that's what I saw. And yeah. I furiously searched, you know, Google for somebody like you as I was going through that. I remember bringing in, you know, McLean Hospital in Boston, acclaimed, you know, good hospital, asking, about you know weird things I'd found on PubMed for experimental um, fish oil injections and stuff like that, and they just looked at me like, "Get out! Like you are not going to bother me with this. I have another patient in five minutes. Like, be on your way. I know what I'm doing." And so, how do you you know deal with cases when it gets to be a more manic situation or these other uh, bipolar, you know, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder? Like, what? How do you just yeah. begin with that? Yeah. It's so funny because I can imagine myself being one of those doctors. I was one of those doctors with like, who couldn't contain the eye roll, you know, about these, these questions we don't have time for about your natural remedies and something you read on, on a blog, you know, um, these are the hallowed halls of, of legitimate medicine. Please take your concerns <laughs> elsewhere, you know, and I absolutely get what it is to defend something that you've invested so much in and and it's 
it's really a religion in the end. You know, uh, my mentor, Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, always talked about, he worked at Memorial Sloan Kettering for a time, and he said, you know, it's got all the trappings of religion with the, the white coat costumes and, you know, the priests with their special language and, you know, the, the doting, worshiping patients who come to pay their respects. And there isn't the room for conversation about what's right for each given individual. And that's already a red flag, right? Whenever the science is settled or whenever there's not um, room for inquiry, we're dealing with dogma and what's often been called scientism, which is the worship of a, a certain kind of approach to science as if it's a destination rather than a process. Um, so I have that sort of in my mind and you know, I feel so passionately about this subject that I hope I don't start like spitting on you and get like red in the face because, you know, I, I'm criticized in, in many, many ways um, publicly, but one of the ones that, that does get, get me hot and bothered is this implication that, oh, well, you know, lifestyle medicine is fine for the worried well, you know, but what about the really sick people? And, and that's probably why I've devoted my career you know, to showcasing and publishing. Right now I have a team of 15 clinical volunteers who are devoted to publishing these cases in the medical literature. We have five published so far. We have a randomized trial underway just for fun, you know, because why not just put it in black and white that severe and, you know, recidivistic mental illness is also um, amenable to lifestyle intervention, and maybe preferentially so. One of the outcomes um, we are publishing is out of Scotland. It's uh, a young man who was diagnosed with chronic schizophrenia. Um, in, he's in his 20s. His, um, he was on you know, medications that are reserved for the severely ill, often require repeated blood draws because they're like not unlike chemotherapy, so toxic that they could, you know, induce a medical crisis. Um, and he was so sick and his quality of life was so compromised that his mom actually thought about taking him to uh, Belgium for euthanasia. Yeah. For a mom to consider that, you know, you can imagine that, that for that to be the most compassionate intervention, like what the, the state of affairs really was. And I never have met these folks. They participated in an online program that I offer, which is essentially a replication of what I do in clinical practice. They did it entirely on their own. And within two weeks, he went from, you know, totally non-functional to seeking employment, you know, within two, two weeks. So I've ha I have many, many of these cases. When, it, when it's that dramatic, like miraculous, spontaneous, you know, remissions, Typically, the first thing I think of is, wow, this was what's called like gluten enteropathy. This was a, a you know, a case of a, a brain allergy, you know, to a very specific um, kind of protein find, found in commonly um, processed foods. And that's all it took. You know, I have another woman, Trudy, who um, is, again, from an online program, so not a patient, right? Because you could say, oh, I do some kind of voodoo in my practice and there are all these fancy people who come to me and it's highly selected. I don't select or screen any of these people, right? So this woman, you know, participated online, did, you know, made these lifestyle changes and she uh, was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, had electroconvulsive treatment, very, very um, ill for many, many decades developed um, diabetes as a result of medication, you know, related adverse effects. And she is symptom free coming off all of, her, all of her medications and went back to her psychiatrist. And he said, well, I guess, I mean, I'm animating it, but you know, he said, I, I guess your bipolar disorder was caused by gluten. <laughs> you know? So, you know, for a conventional doctor to acknowledge that it takes a lot. Um, I really admire that openness. Um, you know, so I actually believe that there are a couple of significant ingredients to facilitating this kind of change in the severely ill population. Because as you can potentially imagine, I'm often the last stop. I wish I was more often the first stop, but at this stage I'm not. And so people come to me when they're headed to state hospital, when they've been on five meds for 25 years, you know, when they have done electroconvulsive therapy, when nothing has worked. Um, and they're cycling through psychosis and mania, or they're chronically suicidal, they've had multiple attempts, 
I have another uh, patient, Allie, who's a very vocal advocate for this work now. And, you know, she had five very serious suicide attempts, had been in, in and out of inpatient hospitals, had severe self-injury habits, and hers was hormonally related um, symptom flares. And within two menstrual cycles, she was in remission. She's been off meds years now. And so part of it is desperation, right, is a great motivator. And so I find that the outcomes that are most dramatic that I see are with the sickest people that I work with or that I have the privilege of interacting with, you know, through my online program. And that is, I don't, you know, that's, I don't do anything. They, they bring that, right? They bring that readiness. Um, so that readiness is a very difficult to quantify. It can, you cannot induce it in someone. It has to organically emerge uh, within them. And, and then another critical ingredient is the mindset piece, right? It's the belief system. So I, because I love data and science, you know, I, I got into the bad habit of trying to convince people, my colleagues, skeptical, you know, family members or even patients of the power of these interventions, the power of sending the body a signal of safety from all of these different directions and letting it recalibrate itself. We don't know how to do it. We don't know what we're doing. That's the unfortunate truth. Uh, and, and, you know, the editor of the, you know, BMJ will admit it as much. This isn't like a a quacky kind of a claim from a holistic, you know, fringe practitioner. From the hallowed halls of within, you know, American and, you know, Western medicine, we are admitting that our, our data has been fudged, you know, it's rife with conflicts of interest, and the majority of what we call gold standard practice is instead actually just consensus medicine, which means it's just what we're doing, so we're doing it. Right. So we really don't know what we're doing. So if we if we have a means of allowing the body to take the wheel, so to speak, you know, then then who are the appropriate patients for that kind of medicine? Well, I would argue everyone, except for I know that this mindset piece, it can't be it can't be bought. Right. So so that has to come because I have worked to convince. I don't think I've ever changed anyone's mind, you know, and I could I could throw data at you all day long uh, because that's how I came to this was through the science itself and, and a good amount of motivation to discover that science, right? So, so you cannot change minds. Um, and so instead, what we can do with this information is, is stir awake, you know, a, a, a knowing that already exists. Um, it's like a remembrance, you know, that's really what it feels like for most of the folks that I work with, it feels like, oh gosh, that makes so much sense. How did I forget that, you know? Right, or like, you know, I always knew that these gut problems were exactly. something I should have paid attention to, or even, you know, I saw, I, I got to interview uh, Kelly Gores, and yes. I know you were in that film as well, and um, ended up doing some EFT work yes. after that, because I was so curious, and um, I figured, you know, I did six months of therapy after my mom passed away, but there must be some more in there, you know, yeah. maybe a little. So I learned a lot of really fascinating things from that. But what I saw was like this, this level of emotional trauma is almost like having a parasite, you know, it's on the effect on your body. It just it's like drain. lingers and yeah. drains and creates so much chronic inflammation. It distorts. Yeah, absolutely. That's the interesting thing about inflammation. You know, it's such a buzzword now. And I think most of us have heard of it and we think, oh, it's this bad thing we want to get rid of. It's, you know, the more we can think about the body as being inherently and innately wise, the, the easier the process of healing is, right? Because instead, inflammation is really, it's, it's just a messenger that is indicative of a need to balance. This is literally, physiologically, all it is. It's not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. There are elements that if they become chronic can, you know, degenerate the body. There are elements that are regenerative, right? But what's interesting about it in, in the research that I've explored is that the body doesn't discriminate. So your psychological stress, your emotionally suppressed arenas, um, your deeper spiritual questions, and your physical exposures, you know, artificial foods and, and toxicant exposures and, you know, lack of sunlight, lack of movement, it all registers the same. The, the body doesn't actually know. 
you can have a psychosocial stressor or a physical stressor, and it reads the same on a cytokine level. To me, that's fascinating because we like to, in, in conventional medicine, think of them, you know, well, there's the mental, emotional, that's kind of over here, but really what we're here for is the body. And I do think, you know, the way I think about it is in terms of a triage. I do think like a Maslow's hierarchy, there's a order of operations. That's my bias. You know, I also am a passionate supporter of energy medicine and shamanism and, and many other more indigenous modalities that offer us the closest to a quick fix we could ever hope for with no side effects, right? But in, in my sort of more biologically based approach, I, I do think, okay, so let's pick the low hanging fruit of the, the physical realm first. Because if you have blood sugar imbalance or caffeine's just not a good fit for you or, you know, alcohol's throwing you all over the place or you have, you know, gluten or dairy antigenicity or, you know, you have a B12 deficiency, it's a simple stuff. The body is so forgiving. Within weeks, you could literally be a different person, also known as more yourself, right? So, so let's start there because it may turn out that you don't have to go on a psycho-spiritual quest, you know, to the motherland of your inner child. Um, and it may, you know, you may liberate energy that allows you to look at toxic relationships and whether or not you're living purposefully or, and, and experiencing adequate amounts of joy in your life, you know. The physical release of the holding of those kinds of chronic symptoms of malaise really does liberate energy for you to bring the rest of your life into focus including neglected areas like relationships and, you know, vocation and money, you know, sort of dynamics, et cetera. But, you know, so I sort of like to think everyone deserves one month of their life, adult life, let's say. It's one month of your life. It goes like this, right? Where, where you conduct an experiment on yourself and you really explore, you know, what is my baseline? Who am I in this body, right? Do I really have anxiety? Do I really have insomnia? You know, am I really struggling with chronic headaches and bloating and constipation? You know, is that who I am? Or can I sort of peel back some of the layers and, and really get a clearer image of what's at the core? You know, so yeah. that's really where I like to start. So starting sort of with the physical and, you know, primarily with food, but there's other components of that, taking out, you know, toxic products and things like that. and um, is your approach, whether it's a slight depression or a manic episode, I mean, that's fascinating. I know, I know. And that's why, you know, when I started to do this work, really dedicating myself to taking people off of medications that I had through my research learned, had the capacity to induce chronically exactly what it is that people went to them for acutely. Like that's the unfortunate, like dirty secret of almost all pharmaceuticals is what it is that you're looking to resolve will now become a chronic problem for you. And the person who really turned me on to this, um, you know, scientific reality is Robert Whitaker, who's an investigative journalist whose book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, changed my life. Literally, there was a before and after in 2010 when I read it, and you know, a friend Again, who's his, a therapist. I get the Mad in America newsletter. So yes, yeah. he's um, he's a very intrepid soul, and and he's not stopped yet. He's really dedicated, and um, and he exposed me to 16 studies that I had never heard of, and I was a science not remember. So it's not that I wasn't reading the papers. I was, and no one ever told me about this non-industry funded literature that, you know, demonstrates some of the acute and chronic concerns about these medications across all categories, mood stabilizers, antidepressants, benzodiazepines, meds for you know, ADHD, all of them. Um, so again, no carve outs for schizophrenia, no carve outs for bipolar um, diagnoses. And what he argues is that the epidemic of mental health disability worldwide, where depression, for example, is the number one cause of disability, according to the WHO, is not some like gene, you know, faulty gene that's now emerging in every single one in 16 Americans. Um, in fact, it is seemingly what we call iatrogenic, which means doctor induced, not intentionally. Um, and in fact, as someone who prescribed it, like I said, to pregnant and breastfeeding women, was I doing that out of malice? <laughs> you know, no, of course not. 
it's just incomplete information. It's the nature of our system that it's largely subsidized and sponsored by the very industry that seeks to profit from prescribing behaviors. It's really that simple. So, you know, when you learn more about these medications, the informed consent process is, would be very different, right? Where you really talk about the potential that these medications have to induce impulsive violence against self and others, including suicide and homicide. Induce in people who otherwise would not engage those kinds of behaviors, you know? And the possibility that these medications are extremely habit forming. In my opinion, and this is something I, you know, have some degree of expertise in, having devoted my entire practice to this for 10 years, um, taking women off of these medications, I'm not sure there's more habit-forming chemical on the planet than your, your run-of-the-mill psychiatric medication. I mean, I don't see, you know, the need to go down by a thousandth of a milligram a month with alcohol, crack cocaine, or Oxycontin, right? So right. what is going on? You know, yeah. we, we just don't know anything about these chemicals. And that doesn't mean that the, the, the effects that they induce might not be desirable for some people, right? If you're in need of a sedative and you, and you take Paxil and makes you sleepy, you might like that. But let's not be confused into thinking that it's correcting an underlying imbalance, right? When we call them antidepressants, even in the subliminal languaging, the implication is they are resolving a, a disease. It couldn't be farther from the truth. And, you know, again, many people have P Peter Bregan and Joanna Moncrief and Irving Kirsch have been screaming from the rooftops about this for many decades. And I just happened to, you know, synthesize a lot of their work at, at a moment when I think there's, um, you know, growing population that's just kind of had enough yeah. and wants and knows there's a better way. And so the question, is it appropriate for people who are really sick? Well, I would say it's really the only thing that's appropriate for people who've tried everything else and have been, you know, turned into patients they wouldn't otherwise be. Yale study shows that one in 23 people who take antidepressants develop a bipolar diagnosis out of the void because of the antidepressant. Wow. We, are, we are manufacturing patients who wouldn't otherwise exist. That's very true for the pediatric population too, or 13% of kids are now medicated with stimulants. And then we have them with diagnoses of bipolar and, and psychotic illnesses oppositional diagnoses that are induced by the fact that they're taking methamphetamine. <laughs> let's right. not forget, right? Just because it comes in a prescription bottle, let's not forget, you know, that these are substances that induce alterations in states of consciousness not different from what we call street drugs. Right. So part of your practice is, you know, tapering women off, and or not just women, all of your patients off antidepressants. And, um, I wonder, do you also have experience doing that with antipsychotics, and is it the same experience? Because that's kind of all I yes. got to know with the lithium and Risperdal and stuff in my mom's case. And um, I was really afraid to yes. have her go off of them because the couple right. of times that she tried, um, you know, she would end up, I mentioned to you before we started filming, like, you know, running away and hiding yes. and, you know, doing whatever and thinking she might hurt herself and these kinds Absolutely. of things. So I just wish I could have had this conversation with you years ago, but you know, how do you, how do you taper somebody off an antipsychotic? So that's a great question. And it gives me the opportunity to address a couple of different points. The, the first is that I had an experience in my clinical practice after I finished Whitaker's book, where I went back literally the next day after closing the last page, crying on the subway, and I said, I will never start a patient on medication again. And I, and I haven't, you know, because I felt that convinced by the data that this is indefensible. Uh, and I had already had my experience resolving my Hashimoto, so I knew I had some tools to work, you know, miracles here. And they were very basic and very accessible um, and that they worked quickly, you know. So I began to sort of marry the two, but in a, in a, a kind of, almost half-hearted way where I said, you know, you might consider making these changes with your diet and you might think about meditating and are you exercising, you know? And I started focusing really on learning how to taper. We're not taught how to do that. And I studied all of these 
bulletin boards and chat rooms and learn from patients because there's no, to this day, it is barely acknowledged um, by the APA, you know, that this is something we need to start talking about. The conversation is starting, uh, but it's, you know, this is years later. And I learned the hard way what it is to come off these medications. I was running what looked like an outpatient rehab, being paged around the clock and filling out medical disability forms for my patients who couldn't work any longer because, you know, it, it w could literally look like acute onset AIDS, you know, where all of their latent conditions are flaring, they're bleeding, their hair is falling out, they've stopped menstruating, they, you know, have all sorts of gastrointestinal issues. They have rashes, they have joint pain, muscle aches, they can't move. I mean, you, you would not believe this if you didn't see it. You know, sometimes I think the greatest form of activism I could provide the world is just to put a video camera on, you know, some of these women I work with in the depths of, of withdrawal. Thankfully these days, it's a different experience for me because that's how and why I learned that foregrounding this experience of you know, resiliency induction, let's say, you know, this month long experience, no cheating, no exceptions, like a hardcore commitment to this preparatory month seems to be enough, you know, to, to change the tone of the entire experience where I have found that it offers a, a level of physical stability that gives us room to work with the emotional, psychological, and spiritual stuff that does come up. Because when you have been saying no to your experience as a human being, which is essentially, in my opinion, what taking a psychiatric medication is, taking really any medication, is a way of saying no to your body, to your heart, you know, to your mind. What you're doing, I don't like it. People don't like it, right? So, so we don't think of it that way, but there's, there is a messaging. Every time you open that bottle, it's got your name on it. There's some part of you that says, I'm broken, I'm messed up, I need this chemical, right? And that is, we have to undo that. We have to undo that. And that takes time, you know? And so mercifully, these tapers take time. So you have this process of being born. It really is that, a rebirth. Um, but physically, the foundation is set. So I have the same protocol, whether you're coming to me because you have symptoms and you've never touched a med, or you've been on five meds for 25 years. It's the same, you know, don't pass, go start here kind of a thing. And that's why, you know, I can put it in a book, I can put it online, I can offer it as a template uh, for you to begin to, to land in your body, you know, and, and start the journey from there. And I do not touch medications during that month. So Meaning they stay on They them. stay on everything, birth control, everything. And it's after that month that we begin the process of tapering. And then it's, it's initially determined by me, you know, where we'll do like a 10%, you know, dose decrease and see how that goes uh, over about two to three weeks. But very quickly thereafter, it's patient led, you know, where they will know, are we going too fast? Do we need to change the pace? Do we need to change the dose decrement? Uh, and there is a, you know, a developing school of thought that says, you know, if these medications are toxic, you wouldn't taper rat poison, right? You just stop it. And, you know, in the, in the taper withdrawal community, that's like heresy. But I'm always interested in things that people don't want to hear about or talk about. So I'm like, well, tell me more. You know, it's not how I've done it, but... You know, it's not what I would recommend, certainly not without this protocol. I, I saw in black and white, you know, like stark contrast what it was in my practice to not do that versus do that um, up front. And, you know, I also just want to say we don't know. We're learning, you know, we're learning. But this is the most serious endeavor you will ever undertake as, as an adult. And it needs to be treated that way. It's not something you just do because you feel like maybe let's see how it goes. This is orienting and turning towards the second chapter in your life. And, and you walk through it as if you're literally walking, you know, through a fire. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the mentality you, you bring to it, you know, because what can come with withdrawal, many conventional doctors, including myself, were trained to call relapse. Right. So what you might have seen with your mom, you might have said, well, look, look how sick she is. Oh, my God, she can't come off meds. But it's just the nature of the neurochemistry, you know, that when you when you stop these meds, sometimes even if you stop them appropriately, strategically, slowly, 
there is a, a rebound that is way worse than anything you ever came to them with, way more intense and traumatic and, and dysregulated, uh, that can look like relapse if you don't know better and if you don't know the literature and if you're not inside the patient's experience saying, no, I've never felt this before. I never went nine months without sleeping before, you know? Right. And in fact, this is medication-induced protracted and complicated withdrawal. So if you don't have that context, then you will misinterpret and you will say, oh, well, this is evidence that I am sick and I do need medication. Well, in right. fact, it's evidence that medication is, has been quite a toxic burden to your body and now we have to heal that. Right. So in healing, <laughs> yeah. um, if anybody hasn't read your book or done your program that's watching this um, and is thinking about you know, themselves or somebody that they love that has some kind of a mental illness and you know, personality disorder, whatever the heck that term means, right. um, anxiety, depression are the most common or you know, something more on the bipolar schizophrenia side. Um, you know, I, I think you're gonna say you start with food, but what have you seen to be the most effective things to kind of do first? And you know, whether it's in a program or just like wake up tomorrow and try to start something. Yeah. So this is not my forte. I'm not a baby steps kind of gal. Uh, I'm learning to be. And in fact, we are about to uh, release a membership for people who want baby steps. I had to get to a place. I had to evolve <laughs> to a place where I could offer that because I have, you know, this more aggressive um, approach. Let's just be honest. And I have found that the results that, that I enjoy, you know, shedding disease labels for life, you know, releasing people from any relationship to prescription, anything for good, you know, that feels like I just liberated an angel, you know, like it, it feels like that. And the requirement for that has seemed to be this deep, uncomfortable commitment, like where you're spending two and a half hours every day taking care of yourself. Who's ever done that, right? Where your whole life is, you know, mandated to be restructured around you and your self-care is not like some window dressing. It is the core of your existence for 30 days. And yes, it's dietary and, and relatively hardcore, although the you know diet that I recommend is not terribly unique. It's food, tastes good. It's like not a juice fast or water fast for you know 30 days. Um, it's, a, it's a daily contemplative practice commitment, so meditation commitment, not long, but three minutes, you know, but it has to be every day, not missing a single, single, single day. Um, and then the rest of it is really, you know, detox related, which is pretty important for most people who find themselves in this kind of position, right? Can I ask you a follow-up question about yeah. the detox? Unless there was another part to that that you were about to say. No, that's okay. Yeah. Um, because I think detox has a really weird connotation yeah, to some like, people. Like I remember actually when, you know, I was told I had some thyroid issues and I have a integrative gynecologist in New York who actually knows you, I think. Um, and she said to me something about detox. Yes. And I felt so like, what the heck does that does have that to do mean? with, you know, I just, I didn't know. Yeah. And she didn't explain it. And so now I've read a little bit more about it and I kind of get why that is a part of disease recovery. But I think a lot of people think of it as just, you've been boozing for December and you detox in January. Oh like that's, God, that's helpful to right? me to know how people think about it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Explain, explain what you mean by it's that. It's not necessarily like a, a correction. It's an alignment with an awareness of what the body needs and wants to thrive. Right. So if you're, you have a plant and you know, you're, you're using I don't know, toilet water and you're dumping your ashtray into it and you put it in a corner, you know, where it doesn't get any sunlight, you're not going to be confused and surprised when it wilts and dies, right? But we, we don't have that awareness. We're not raised in our bodies. We're raised to become functional minds that click into the corporate system. I mean, so, so the understanding that our body communicates with us all day long is something that, you know, is a later life development for most of us, myself included. And to, to read your body's language, you know, your body is this like refinement tool that, that is translating energies for you. And, and that's what symptoms are. 
um, they're not mistakes. They're not, you know, errors. And so to understand how symptoms emerge, part of that is understanding that, you know, the, I don't know, 100,000 unstudied toxic chemicals in our environment, thanks to unregulated industry, it's not meant to be that way. So the natural world and your physical body are going to gently, gently remind you, you know, <laughs> tap on your shoulder until they start screaming, right? And so it, it, the, the detox is, is largely related to synthetic compounds that we in our great wisdom have, uh, have created and exposed the natural world to, including our bodies that really don't have mechanisms for managing or dealing with these, you know, perchlorates from your dry cleaner, uh, for example. And so medication would be included in that. You know, you cannot patent a natural chemical. So everything that you take by prescription, I shouldn't say everything, unless it's a bioidentical hormone, you know, is, is going to be a, a compound that your body did not evolve to, to recognize. Um, it's like jamming a key into a lock that doesn't really totally fit. Right? right, and uh, that's how birth control works, for example, with synthetic, you know, progestins, and so you know the liver is really chiefly in charge of of managing that. So one of the, you know, the detox tools that really changed my practice, I learned from my mentor, and and without going on a flourish about him, you know, there's never been anyone like him, as far as I know, in the history of medicine, you know, who had the outcomes over 27 years of degenerative illness and terminal cancers with totally natural lifestyle-based changes, long-term outcomes that have never been matched with conventional treatments, right? So this is not equal to, this is superior to, right? And so he taught me about the power of the coffee enema, the now notorious. The internet loves me and Gwyneth Paltrow from what we have to say. Yeah, about. I mean, it definitely <laughs> makes enema. people like, what? You know? I know, but... and I would have said, that. I absolutely would have said the same thing. Like, what stupid blog did you read that on? And if I hadn't learned it from, you know, a pedigreed clinician that I revered, who showed me a paper from the New England Journal of Medicine of schizophrenic patients who were hospitalized for two weeks with no intervention, save for coffee enemas daily, who were discharged symptom free, then I would have been, you know, skeptical, you know, and then I would have seen, I saw through him that these were in the Merck manual until, you know, they were taken out in the 70s for space considerations. And now, of course, with pharmaceutical, you know, orthodoxy dominating everything, there's no room for these kinds of, this kind of inclusion, right? So, so really what it is, is a, is a, a self-administered method for um, relieving the liver of its, its burden. And to think we can just waltz around the world and not engage detox, detox practices, whether it's, you know, using a rebounder or dry brushing or different Ayurvedic practices or saunas, you can take your pick. But the hubris of thinking that we don't have to do anything to counteract, you know, what we're doing to this planet, it's just a, a form of being asleep, you know, and you can be asleep until you choose to wake up, right? Or you can yeah. pretend to be asleep yeah. after that. Well, I know that you detailed a lot of the different things that are kind of causing toxins to accumulate in the brain and have these symptoms in your book. So anybody who is interested in this topic should definitely get it. It's called A Mind of Your Own. Yeah. So my last question for you, because um, I could talk to you all day, I can't believe that we're out of time, but um, is beyond what you know, you sort of devise or suggest that people do when they start on this program is you know, a mix of dietary, a mix of detox, and a mix of meditation practice what do you do every mm -hmm. single day to keep yourself well yeah so i get wealthy by a committing you know fiercely to my self-care it is my number one priority my children know that my partner knows that my family knows that everyone really who touches my life is aware that my self-care comes first and that involves um, a daily pre-dawn meditation which i do not miss ever under any circumstances, which pulls me to bed by nine o'clock. So I'm a sleep Nazi. And I am because I used to stay up as a workaholic till 2 a.m. every morning. And when I committed to meditation, which of course I did out of desperation, when my mentor suddenly passed, and I realized I had to start going to bed earlier if I was going to be getting up at 5.30 in the morning. This wasn't going to work if I was burning the candle at both ends. So I uh, started going to bed earlier and it changed my entire life. You know, my productivity exploded. You know, I was able to lose 
five hours a night that I otherwise would have been up at my computer and somehow just like be in flow all day long, getting things done in ways I never knew was so, could be so effortless, right? So yeah. I'm very passionate about that. So yeah, I, I spend about 45 minutes to an hour um, in different kinds of meditative practices, ranging from Kundalini yoga to Qigong to, you know, using Yoni egg to listening to binaural beats to different, you know, kinds of physical practices, asanas um, every morning. And I, I don't know where I'd be without that um, commitment. And it doesn't always feel magical, but it's at this point like taking a shower, brushing my teeth. Uh, and then I dance every day, um, which was a part of reprioritizing my self-care on, on this level and part of my move out of New York, out of the vortex of New York, where I was constantly saying I don't have time and I had to commute. And, you know, there's a way to really take a leap in your life where you put your joy first. And I never really understood what people meant by that until I began to see that my fear was keeping me locked, um, a victim. So I, with my patients or um, in my own life, I'm always scanning like a lighthouse for that victim mentality. Any time in a relationship, in life circumstances, in your medical experience, um, you feel like you are a victim of something you can't control. It's an illusion. You're creating it. You're creating it. And so to really do hygiene on your life and find and ferret out all those places where you feel victimized in different relationships is a very empowering practice, even if it feels like it's blaming the victim initially to yeah. take responsibility for No, I was just going to, I, I feel this is very relevant to me right now, but do you recommend people who are sort of realizing, you know what, I think maybe I am acting like I'm a victim. Like, oh, we all do it. We do it all the time. Working I mean, yeah. with somebody in that circumstance or just kind of trying to figure it out on your own? What do you like? Do you think you kind of you'll need somebody see, else for that? You'll learn it. Not necessarily. Uh, you know, I'm a big believer in, in different kinds of therapies and family therapy and energy medicine and EFT. And however, in the end, it's your own personal you're your own personal account accountability buddy, right? Where, and, and you'll, you'll start to notice it because it's anywhere you say like, oh, this isn't fair, right? Like, it's like your inner child's like, this is not fair. It's not fair that he's like that, or it's not fair that I have to do this. It's always the voice of it. And so you'll, you'll see it like, you know, it's not fair that I'm the only doctor in New York who does this and I have to go to my office every day. You know, it's like this martyr kind of vibe or, um, in relationship, it's pretty prevalent. Like whenever we feel hurt, we would rather think that somebody somebody did that to us out of carelessness than that we co-created that, um, and maybe even are are maintaining it. You know, uh, so when you when you get the emotional signature of you know what in this world is called a trigger, when you when you recognize what your triggers are, you'll see they always have a victim story attached to them, and you know this is one of my, my most passionate advocacies is helping patients out of their victimhood and into personal empowerment. And I see that I, I write these victim stories for myself all the time. It's natural, you know, it's, it's part of becoming an emancipated adult, an actualized adult, to understand that our child wounds and patterns are those of victimization. And in part because we, almost all of us were in some way you know, victimized by incomplete love and attention, you know, and, and worse, abuse or neglect. Um, and we're still letting that child drive our car, right? So part of, part of the work that my patients have to do and I do, um, you know, once they're off medications, or in my case, just as a part of my awakening process, is to really just understand that you, you're the adult here. That's all way distant history. And you can handle these emotions. I could talk to you all day, but I know you've got a busy life of things to do. So we will wrap up and just thank you so, so oh, much for you having for me your in your home and for everything that you do. Your work is so inspiring to me and so important. I hope that you are also inspiring a lot of providers, young you know, medical students to think differently because you know, I'm here trying to spread awareness and, and bring people who have you know seen both sides into the well-being community so that they can 
see how brilliant you are and that you know they don't their perception of a doctor and what's medicine could be turned on its head but i also really hope that people who are going to practice medicine yeah. um, start to you know and i think you doing trials with your with your course and your your community is a wonderful way for that to to happen because i know there's other data and science junkies like you who yes. will um, appreciate that and be able to take it to the powers that be and say, you know, this is why I'm going to be doing this differently or, or just do it differently because like, we'll screw see. asking for yeah, permission. We'll see because yeah. I love that um, Bucky Fuller quote, you know, that you can't change the existing system from within. I'm paraphrasing. You have to create a new system that makes it obsolete. And I really believe in, I believe in grassroots change. And I, I even believe in, you know, a medicineless world where, where we don't need a doctor. You know, again, I've seen it dozens and dozens of times through my program, no doctor involved. And, you know, these, these recoveries are just activating your own internal, um, you know, healing toolkit. And yeah, maybe you need inspiration, you know, but do we really need doctors? I'm not so sure. Or you are your own doctor yeah. or you are the best doctor or yes, whatever is 100%. A, a, a quote I've heard over and over and over. And I, I think that. you're absolutely right. You know, for some sort of viral infection that's about to take you down, like go seek, you know, that doctor. But otherwise you have everything you need that's kind right. of within you. So right. thank you for sharing all of that with us. And yeah. Yeah. Thank again. you. It's a pleasure.